Cognitive scientist from Sheffield and his talk is going to be about rational choices about who to trust. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. No. Now? 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 Yeah. Okay. Good. Good afternoon. Yes, I can hear me now. Great. It's really good to be here. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I gave a talk for the public about the psychology of advertising. And um, I asked the audience, do you think advertising works? And there was a sea of hands. Everyone put their hand up. And then I said, does advertising work on you? Nada. What I discovered there, I later found out, was the thing called the third person effect uh, from political science. And this is the belief that information, misinformation, propaganda disproportionately affects other people. And what I want to think about today, what I've been thinking about, what I want to share with you, is the model of rationality, of cognition, that that implies. Maybe it's something like this. There's the rational people and the irrational people, the biased. And obviously, we all know which side, which kind of category we're in. Um, and this is completely incoherent. It can't be that everyone is rational and everyone else is irrational because, you know, we all believe this. But lately, another model of rationality has received a lot of circulation. And these are so-called dual process models. So um, you might have heard of uh, Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a great exposition of a, a program of work in psychology that's incredibly influential. And it's sort of like this. It's that, you know, the line of division is no longer between people, but it's within us. Um, and if you take home one thing from this talk, it's that this model of rationality is deeply problematic. There are all sorts of conceptual and empirical problems with it. But what I want to say today is that the implication, the problem with it for, for us is it encourages us to divide people into the biased and the less biased because we all know that probably this, this represents other people with a mostly bias and each of us is probably, you know, the rationality bit is a bit bigger. It also encourages you to think that you can skim off the top. You can take the bias out um, and that's not true. But fortunately, other models of rationality are available, other models of bias. This is uh, psychology's greatest gift to the scholarly world, I think, signal detection theory. Probably many of you are familiar with it, but I'll just rehearse this. Say you're trying to do a classification task. You've got claims, they're true or false, so the top row is true claims and the bottom row is false claims, and you make a judgment about them. You say that claim is true or that claim is false. True, left column, false, right column. And you can be correct in two ways. You can say true claims are true, or you can say false claims are false, and you can make two kinds of errors. You can raise a false alarm where you say a, a false claim is true, or you can get a miss where you say uh, a true claim is false. Signal detection theory gives you the conceptual and statistical um, framework for um, distinguishing people's sensitivity, either their ability to discriminate, from their bias towards making one of these errors. And the important thing is that you can't not make, you can't not choose to have a bias. You're always trading off between whether you're going to risk making a false alarm or whether you're going to risk having misses. If false alarms are particularly dangerous, you can avoid making them, but only at the cost. You can avoid saying that's true but only at the cost of saying more things are false and therefore having a raised error rate for misses. So in this model, bias is neither good nor bad. Bias, and in, bias is an intrinsic property of the system and you have to choose a position. And so uh, here's some empirical work we did a long time ago. Uh, Richard Iser realized that he could use this... Um, idea that uh, when trying to um, decide about whether to trust information, individuals are intuitive signal detection theorists. So 
they are trying to work out the accuracy, the sensitivity of the person communicating, but also what bias they have. Uh, and we did this survey where we look at householders who have their houses on brownfield land, land that's previous industrial land, and where there's a history of claims about pollution and risks of pollution for those householders. And, when, and we went and surveyed um, those household, householders, and we asked them, who do you trust to tell you about pollution risks? So this is a study of science communication, basically. Um, and we asked about these groups on the left, do you trust scientists, local government, property developers, friends and family? And we also asked them, as well as your general trust in believing, your willingness to believe what these people say about uh, pollution risks on your, for your house, we also asked about these other, the perception of these other qualities these groups might have. So what do you think their expertise is about pollution? How open are they? How biased are they to perceiving a risk, how biased are they about communicating the risk, do they share your values? Um, and here's some, here's some graphs of the results. So um, we asked people on a one to five scale, how much do you trust scientists? Good news for the scientists in the room. The mode answer was five. Ex scientists are extremely trusted to communicate about these risks. Uh, bad news for property developers in the room. <laughs> they didn't trust property developers. Um, but importantly, not everyone trusted the scientists. And because we'd asked about those components of trust, we could um, then look at what predicted who did or didn't trust scientists. Um, and you might think that people who didn't trust the scientists doubted their expertise. But that's not true. So these are uh, bars of uh, two groups, people who had high trust in scientists and those, that minority that had low trust in scientists. And their ratings for the expertise of scientists was high. A bit lower for the right group, but everyone recognized that scientists knew about the science of pollution. The predictor, the thing that determined whether people were willing to trust scientists or not, was not the expertise. It wasn't the perception of bias. It was whether they thought that the scientists had their interests at heart. That was the thing that predicted across our population whether people trusted the scientists or not. So this is the same high and low trust groups, but their ratings of has my interest at heart for scientists. So you can throw this into a regression model and you can look at how the different variables predict trust. And so what you see is not the ratings of trust, but you see how variance in the components predicts variance in trust. That's this graph here. It's got the different groups along the bottom, from local council to local media, and it's got the coefficient on the y-axis. And what you can see is that for all groups, the thing that predicted whether that individual trusted, or whether individuals trusted that group to tell them about risks, was in blue, shared values. Did these people have your interests at heart? And there's expertise in red, pretty low actually, a bad predictor of trust. Or bad, no sorry, a bad predictor of variance in trust. So I was thinking about this recently. Uh, uh, the, the role of expertise is, is, uh, is contested and um, uh, particularly around uh, Brexit. Um, uh, that, that, there was discussion of that. This is a YouGov survey from uh, 2016. Uh, I apologize for it being so small. What it, it asked people who voted leave and voted remain or intend to vote remain or leave, do they trust different groups in society? And the ones in red are the ones with the largest discrepancy. And what you find is that one, across the board, remain, remainers have much lower trust. Uh, sorry, leavers have much lower trust. The biggest discrepancy between leavers and remainers is these four groups, academics, economists, people from the Bank of England, and people from international organizations. What YouGov didn't ask, and I wish they had, was why don't you trust those people? Why are you sick of experts? And I predict that it would be because these people on the, on the right, the Leave supporters, perceived that academics, economists, the Bank of England, and the people from the NGOs didn't share their interests. They weren't it wasn't that they weren't experts in the consequences of Brexit, it was that they had, did not have the interests, their interests at heart. 
So what I'm not saying is that they were irrational to um, reject expertise. The moral is that every reason has a bias. Every bias is there for a reason. So just like the fire alarm that goes off too often, that's not a simple bias. That's in there because it's much better to have a few false alarms than for you to burn to death in your bed without the fire alarm going off. Uh, so here's some old white guys for you. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I'm not going to say any of these guys are irrational. I wanted to, this is another way of kind of thinking about every, um, every bias being there for a reason. You've heard of logical fallacies. If you're interested in fact checking, you've probably seen lists of these on the internet. The ad hominem fallacies, you, you attack someone, you attack an argument because of who's saying it. Now I've put these guys up because I hope whatever your ideological persuasion, there's someone on this lineup here who really, really annoys you. Um, <laughs> And if they told you, and some, there's some guys here, if they told me that the sky was blue, the earth was round, cats were nice, you know, I would still not believe it because it was them. You know? The ad hominem fallacy is a strict fallacy, but that bias to, to, have to, to weight the source of the information is, is obviously useful. So here's some more recent work. Um, how long have I got? Ten minutes? Less than ten minutes. Seven minutes, good. Here's some more recent work I've been doing with Kate Dommer, a political scientist at the University of Sheffield. We've been looking at um, uh, perceptions of advertising and targeting of advertising. Here's a, as a small survey of uh, users of Facebook. Um, we asked them about uh, their trust in Facebook, their trust in advertisers, their trust in political parties, and their trust in the civil service. Civil service is there because it's the civil service and the military that are always at the top of uh, population trust averages. Um, and we asked about their specific trust in these components. Do you think these people are good at keeping your data secure? Are they transparent? Do they promote your interests, the public interest? Are they well regulated? Uh, the, the headline is that Facebook is actually highly trusted among our population. Okay? Not as much as the civil service, but much more than advertisers and political parties. Here's the same graph. What predicts whether Facebook variation in whether these people are trusted? Well, I thought it would be, do they have your interests at heart, which is in green. So that does predict somewhat. But actually, the biggest predictor of trust in uh, those organizations or that platform um, is, do people believe that they can keep your data secure? Um, more recent work, um, this is a welcome trust funded project on uh, vaccines. It was a kind of small pilot um, uh, user research or what I might call an ethnography done by Shift Design. They went to parents of young children in London who were thoughtful, hesitant about giving their children the vaccines and they had seen some vaccine related content online. And they sat with them and they asked them about how they found information. Um, and uh, how they related to health information online. And I want to pull out a few results here that reinforce this, this story I'm trying to tell you that people have uh, reasons for their biases and reasons for their choices that we can investigate. And there is a story of hope there for the people in this room at the end of these two days about our ability to persuade on good grounds. So um, this is... Um, these are posts, again, I apologize, they're small. These are posts from people who are vaccine hesitant, praising the importance of research. So this woman here says, I've done an hour of research a day for nine months on vaccines. Now, admittedly, she's come to what I think is the wrong conclusion. She doesn't want to vaccinate. But users are actively seeking information. They're not passively consuming it um, across both sides of this uh, uh, issue. Um, users are evaluating different kinds of evidence. So here's a picture. One user is saying, you can't trust that. Is it just a picture? It's not facts. Another person is saying, that shows you something true. It's hard to fake a picture, so it's reliable. So they disagree, but they're evaluating evidence. Um, and again, related to the idea of trusting sources and uh, um, people evaluating whether the, the source of information has shared interest with them. 
people are navigating social media and the information on social media socially. Uh, Rasmus said something along these lines uh, at the beginning of the day. That the information, information is not just facts. It's, um, um, it's, it's uh, social and performative primarily. Um, and so what that we found in this project was that people were getting vaccine information through social groups and often innocuously they would join a parenting group when they became parents. Some people in the parenting group would be part of a natural parenting group. Some people in the natural parenting group would be part of uh, health groups or health lifestyle groups and they would uh, push anti-vaccine information or vaccine information that would uh, filter down to reach people who weren't necessarily looking for it. But it's arriving through a group, uh, it's arriving in a context that people um, are familiar with. So what I want you to do when you hear uh, people discuss the consumers of misinformation or disinformation is think about the model of rationality that's implied. So we've had from the floor today, people don't want to hear the oh, yes sir, I think it was, we, the, people don't want to hear the science. I'm saying something very different. People actively seek information, they evaluate the quality of information, they weigh evidence, they evaluate it socially as well, they're trying to make meaning in their consumption of information. Those are all incredibly hopeful things for a fact-checking community. This is the model that I would propose, is that bias and rationality are two sides of the same thing. Um, so, yes, there is bias in the way we consume information. Yes, we're driven to reject information that disagrees with what we already believe, but that is a kind of rationality. It would be crazy just to drop everything you thought when something new, a single new piece of information comes along. Our biases are unavoidable, they're universal, but they deal with risk and they're there for reasons. And as fact checkers, I think you should be optimistic. I'm optimistic because I've what. I've seen here because I think there's an opportunity to work with a better model, a truer model of the way people process information. If you can um, provide good information, consistent and clearly signal both that information and the values you have, then um, there are lots of reasons to be optimistic about people's ability to come to rational, reasonable, good conclusions. Um, and I guess, uh, on the final note, if people, um, if people say, oh, the experts aren't trusted, I would turn that around and say, the question we should ask is, how do we show people that we're on their side and that will generate trust? Thank you very much. Thanks. Any questions from the audience? There's one in two. Thank you so much for this really important um, contribution Thank and you. piece of the bigger puzzle that we've been talking about for the past two days. Um, do you have any examples of people who have tried to apply this approach? Can you talk a little bit about how and if and where this works? When, when we sort of turn this upside down and there's a stalemate between, you know, mm -hmm. scientists and anti-vaxxers. Okay. Uh this approach is really what I want to, I want to do a figure ground reversal on people's idea that there are rational and irrational people. Um, we're all a bit irrational. We, we, we're not, the idea of irrationality doesn't even make sense. We've all got biases and the biases are there for a reason. I've got a, a longer argument we probably don't have time for, which is that if you go and look at the, the history of evidence that people um, push to show that um, the public is biased and irrational, Every single piece of that evidence can be reinterpreted as people are um, somewhat reasonable, hesitantly, with poor resources, trying to seek after truth. Um, but the details of that are probably a bit much to go into. Maybe the other question while the next speaker is setting up. Oh, Ivan? Um, hi, over here. Um, so my question is... Hi. Hi. <laughs> Great talk. Um, how do you get, how do you show people that you're on their side? I think that's one for discussion as well. How do you, how do you, well, I think because information processing is, a, is about meaning, it means that just giving people 
information on the unit of analysis, I mean, this resonates a bit with what Kate said, the unit of analysis is not a single fact or a single piece of information. Uh, there is a role for being, for radiating the intent you have for being transparent, not just about how you do what you do, but why you do what you do. And I think that is what, in the long term, will show people that you're on their side. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And the final